Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it uh, brings us to the last lecture of the day. Um, and with this lecture, we close Genetic Genealogy Ireland 2019 Belfast uh, for another year. Um, we will hopefully be back in Dublin uh, later on uh, this year in October, third weekend in October. So if you haven't had enough DNA this weekend, there's more for you waiting in Dublin in about seven months' time or so. So. Uh, for this last presentation, it gives me a pleasure to present Cahill McElgun. Now, Cahill is um, a molecular biologist who works in industry in the Cambridge area. He has uh, done a huge amount of his own personal research into the the intricacies of, of DNA, but he's not going to talk to us too much about that today because his other major interest is in the DNA of the Monaghan and Fermanagh border, which is the area from where a lot of his ancestors come from. So with a lot of very interesting and celebrity examples, <coughs> please give a welcome to Cahill Michael Gunn. Thank you very much, Morris. Pleasure. I'm even going to adjust the microphone for you so that you're better poised. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk to you today about the uh, lesser known aspects of the Fermanagh Monaghan transborder DNA and history. So, the contents of the talk are going to focus on the time course of our history in Fermanagh and Monaghan, and maybe to a lesser extent, Cavan, from the Ice Age through to the plantation. I'm not going to go past the plantation because we already know that quite well. Um, I'm going to focus on two tribes which perhaps you haven't heard of at all. And then talk about the ancient families of the barony of Clan Kelly. And then the genetic flux that was created by the plantation. And then I'm going to talk about Willem van Aranya's emigres. And I wonder if any of you have any idea who he is and who they are. <laughs> so this is a glacier somewhere in Alaska. Can you imagine living there? With difficulty. With difficulty. Well, this is what Ireland was like before 11,000 BC. And because... Oops, because everything was covered with glaciers, it was extremely inhospitable, and we had no little t technology back then to survive that. Uh, it was too cold to support growth of vegetation, so therefore there was no human settlement. At 11,000 BC, some climate change occurred, and the Ice Age ended. And at that point, humans moved out of a Caucasus pocket, Caucasus pocket and moved into Europe, and across the land bridge into Britain and Ireland before the ice completely melted. So here's the time course as, as I'm doing it today. We start off with the Ice Age where there's nobody. Uh, at 11,000 BC, yeah, that ends, and the hunter-gatherers move in from the continent. The, at 8,000 BC, BC, the Mesolithic farmers move in, followed by the Neolithic farmers at 4,000 BC, and then we have two very ill-defined groups of people who we don't quite know who they are, at least from my reading, there seems to be some debate. It's the Fear of Bogs and the Tua de Danon. Now, at this point, one interesting thing is the word fear is man or men, and bogs sounds rather like Belge for Belgium. I'm just planting that there at this point. Uh, and they end at 600 BC when maybe Milesius, the Gales, moved in from the continent somewhere, potentially Iberia. So here we have the Gales. Now at 6 BC we have a crowd called the Menapians in Wexford, and you're probably wondering who they are. Then in three, uh, 293 to 297 AD we have somebody called Carusius, and you're probably wondering who he is. Then we had 300 AD, we have another three group, group of three lads called the Three Collars, and some of you might have heard of them. And then we have Niall of the Nine Hostages in 400, and we have Christianity coming initially with Palladius and then with Patrick, although, however, it's not impossible that there were people before Palladius as well, because Palladius was sent by the church to the Christians who already were in Ireland, according to the records. Then, these crowd here that were in Wexford in 6 BC moved up to Fermanagh and, and Monaghan in uh, 845 AD. 
And then we have the Golden Age of Monasticism, of, of which part of that is the Dalriata move into Scotland. And then at 795 AD, we have these fellas coming down from Norway and Scandinavia to steal a few things and uh, return back home. But in 852 AD, they formed a place called Dublin, which became the capital of the Hiberno-Norse world, eventually. And in Scotland in 900 AD, Gaelic replaced Pictish as the language of Scotland. And then in 1114, Brian Baru defeated the Vikings and the Leinster people at uh, the Battle of Clontarf to end the Viking period in Ireland. But that didn't last for too long since in uh, 1169 AD, the Norman, no, Anglo-Normans, who were the descendants of the Vikings who'd settled in Normandy, turned up and took over again. Now, Anglo-Norman, to my simple mind, Anglo-Normans continued until 1610 AD. And then in 1649 AD, we had the English Republic. This is Oliver Cromwell. This is, he, uh, or Parliament had beheaded King Charles I, and England was actually a republic at this stage. And in 1662, the Huguenots arrived, escaping France from persecution. And I've put this in Dutch just to be pedantic. This is uh, Koning William de Derde, Hendrik van Oranje, and gekomen met Nederlandse Deens and Hugse Truppen. Now, how many of you can understand that? Wow. <laughs> so King William of or 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 Orange arrived in, in Ireland with Dutch, Danish, and Huguenot troops. And then in 1709, this is particularly relevant in my family, uh, Napoleon was causing trouble in the Palatine uh, Rhineland and a whole pile of German refugees came to Ireland via um, England and I actually have a line into my family of Palatine Germans. So, next slide. Right, does anybody know where this is? Fermanagh. <laughs> Does anybody know specifically where this is? Hand, hand up. <laughs> Christina. That'll be about right. That's the, the road heading towards Belfast from Enniskillen, and this is Menapian Way. You've heard me talk about these Belgian guys before, so there's a road in Enniskillen named after them, and there's a reason for that. The Menapians. So... The basis of this is a number about in 2008 I had family connections with Belgium and I'm from Fermanagh and I thought oh this there's this whole Belgian thing in Fermanagh the name of Fermanagh has come from a Belgian tribe so I was interested to see whether one I was a, a Belgian and to understand whether um, to understand how these people had impacted on, on Fermanagh so a gentleman called Norman Mongan who died a couple of years ago wrote a book called the Menapier Quest 2,000 years of the Menapi, seafaring Gauls in Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and the Isle of Man uh, from 216 BC to 1990 AD. That's, he wrote the book in, in 1995. It's now off print. But, so they were a Belgi tribe origin, originating from the hinterland of the Rhine estuary and coastline in the modern territory of the Netherlands, Belgium, and France. They were initially unconquerable by the Romans, as the Roman legionaries were very heavily armed and the Menapians would just sneak into the marshes and then the legions couldn't go after them. But eventually they were subdued. And in modern Wexford, on the Claudius Ptolemy map of 2 AD, we find them there, marked. Now, in discussions with Gerard, Ptolemy was just taking second-hand accounts from seafarers but, you know, we still have a reasonable clue that these people were in Ireland in, in 2 AD. Now, they made the mistake of killing the son of the King of Leinster. And on the basis of doing that, they were banished to Fermanagh and Monaghan in 485 AD. Note their names are Manapi or Menapi, and you see the, the men and the man coming through to Fermanagh and Monaghan. And Fermanagh means the men of the manor. So I mentioned Karausius before. Uh, this is a, a picture of him from a coin, probably from the Frome Horde. And he was, his full name was Marcus Aurelius Mausius Valerius Carusius, and he began life as a Menapian sailor. 
and ended life, well, later on as the Admiral of the Roman Empire's Channel, English Channel Fleet. And what he was doing was counteracting the Saxon pirates who were hindering Roman trade between Gaul and Britain. So what he did was he held on to the treasure he took off the Saxons. And with this, declared himself Emperor of Britain and a bit of France in 286 AD. And he was responsible for the minting of the first coins in London. And we find these in the Frome Hoard. And that's a picture of him and one of his coins. Uh, he was ultimately assassinated by his finance minister in 293 AD. I mean, you can imagine the Roman Empire was not particularly happy that this guy had freelanced and took, took over Britain. So my humorous interpretation of this was, was the first emperor of Britain a Fermanagh man? <laughs> so the Menapians today here is uh, a figure from Norman Mungan's book. And we can see where they were where their homeland was, and they ended up in Cornwall, in Wexford, in the Isle of Man, in Fermanagh Monaghan, and up in Scotland here. So according to Norman, um, the surnames Mooney, Meany, am I going to read all of these out? <laughs> Monaghan, Mannion, Minogue, Minnick, <coughs> Mannix, all these names Norman Mongan speculated, or maybe he has some evidence for it, we have to read the book to figure it out, are of Menapian origins. Now, I have searched for the preparation of this talk whether there was any haplotype information of the Y chromosome with regards to the Menapians. And a gentleman in Belgium called Bat Bedouin de Krombrugge de Luringe contends that the Menapian Y chromosomal haplotype is this. And some of you experts will understand what this is. And some of you who are not, don't worry about it. It won't, it won't kill you if you don't know it. <laughs> so we could in this room today have people of Menapian descent, potentially. And in the greater world, these are Minogues. You may be familiar with them. And that's the comment I made this morning about your neighbors. Oh, yes. <laughs> So, when I was communicating with Norman Mongan back in 2008 and buying his book, he offered to take me on a tour of this promontory fort just north of Dublin, which is called uh, Dromanach. This essentially was a Menapian trading station. So their ships would come in from Gaul, and they'd have a defense. They had a defensive position here. I'm presuming that they had some kind of wooden pier out into the Irish Sea, they'd land their wine, and then the, the Irish would come in here, trade, buying the stuff from the continent. That's what we think. Uh, this served as the Tradium Emporium, and was the location that the earliest Roman artifacts in Ireland were found, Roman coins and the like. So this is Norman Mungan, and you see here, you've seen already a street in Enniskillen called after the Menapians, but here is the street in Brussels called after them. In French, Rue de Menapien and uh, Menapierstraat. And you can see the similarity between Dutch Strat and uh, street in English. So next on to the three collars. Now, to focus back here, where did they appear? They appeared in 300 AD. Um, I haven't gone into great detail in the time course with respect to the three collars, needless to, just to say that they, they arrived at this point. But who were they? They were, and I do forgive my Gaelic pronunciation because I don't know it that well, and if anybody helps me out, I'll be most appreciative. Uh, there were three fourth century brothers, and they were the sons of Uchid Dolmen. <laughs> and son, I, I'm a, this was what I got from a document. I think this is probably an autocorrect in somebody's writing. <laughs> But I, I didn't have the wherewithal this morning to confirm it, so don't take, take that with a pinch of salt. It might be right, it might not. Uh, the son of Eilek, the daughter of Udher, the king of Alba. Of course, all of this is subject to subsequent historical alteration to suit the current political agenda back in 500 AD or something. But their names were Carwell Kala Us, Murda Kala. Fulcri, 
and eight column men. There were three of them. Now, their descendants gave rise to the surnames Began, Boylan, Carroll, Connolly, Higgins, Hughes, Kelly, McDougall, McCauley, McLean, McDonald, Maguire, McKenna, McMahon, and some others. And this is the Y chromosomal haplotype. And again, the experts will know what they're looking at here. And I wouldn't worry about it if it was anybody else, unless you're from that family, and then you can start taking it very seriously. Uh, all of this work is from Peter Biggins with Josiah Maguire, Patrick McMahon and Tom Roderick, and they have a PDF on a website that you can download and have a read of quite simply. So a gentleman called Donald Shegel made a hypothesis published in the Clotter Record a number of years ago uh, about their origins. Um, and the key points here were that each of these collars commanded 300 men who were given to them by their grandfather, who was King Ugadi. Now, they also had a, a Roman-type name structure composed of a prenomen, a nomen, and a cognomen, which was not typically Gaelic in origins. And Schegel suggested that King <coughs> Ugari could be cognate for Vicari or the vice tribune rank of a Roman legion. And, and there's also cognates between uh, their name and the trio of Antes, which was a tribe in the region of Colchester. Now, Schegel concluded that the three colours were each Romano-British centurions, hence the 100 men each, and that they came from the present day, of, day area of Colchester, whereas Biggins concluded they were from northwest Britain. So we, the DN, we can use the DNA to try and figure this out, basically. So, and I want to stimulate some discussion and thoughts among people in, in the area to see whether we can progress this a little further. So then the Normans in Fermanagh, and the answer to this question is essentially, no, there weren't any. Because they came here in 1169, and if you look at the castle distribution in Fermanagh, there were no Norman castles built in the area. Ulster was relatively free of, of Norman op occupation. And the castle in Enniskillen, in case you're wondering, was originally built by the Maguires, not Norman at all. But the people who live down here, you can easily imagine them being pushed out of down here by these Normans coming in, and you can easily imagine them ending up in places like Fermanagh where the Normans were not present. So that moves, on, moves us on to the plantation, enhancing the complexity of our generation four hits, and there is a method in this madness. <coughs> So the plantation started here in 1610, which is actually not such a long time ago. And here from the Clocher Record article by John Johnson, we see the increase in British plantation people from 1610 to the late, well, six, 1660. And also from that article, we can see it, the distribution of Irish in Fermanagh at the same time. They also, he also has a similar figure for the distribution of English at various time points in Fermanagh. So this is me and what I'm trying to get at here is working back through the generations to see how many segments, what percentage and how many centimorgans could be left of me in this time course. So we know all of these guys, we don't know the dates of this fellow but we know that this fellow was, was farming flax in Belturbet and he died in 1846. And then we're extrapolating back using a 30 year generation to think when my eighth, seventh or eighth great grandfather would have been and this is bang smack in the middle of the plantation. So then we have my jet match hits. But it's not only my jet match hits, this, I've used Excel. This is a consolidation of me and two of my father's sisters. So we're getting the maximum amount of hits. And then I've done uh, remove identical, is that the term? Remove duplicates, just to leave the maximum hit. And so you can see the names here. We got my close family members and my father's mother was Clifford. This is on my, entirely on my paternal line. And the Clifford's, um, 
grandmother's mother or father was a Collins, and then we see there are McConnells and McKernans, and if we hark back to the name, to the, to, uh, I'm, going, I'm going to actually go forward rather than back, and my Tommen was my great, great grandmother. And we see a lot of names, we see Clifford's are continuing, we see Hares. Now this is a plantation name, which is associated with this particular castle. Uh, but we know, we know this is a relatively, where is it, recent one, because we actually know that one of the Collins has married one of the Hares, so that's where that came from. And then we start to go into territory where we, we don't know where things are happening. These cores here, there was a, there was a Macagon married a core a while back, but there are additional cores that we don't know where they come from, and this is probably coming from the plantation type. And here we have Caldwell, which is a castle family down in Belique, and they were in this castle, which is now in complete ruins. And then if we go further down, we see a mixture of native Irish and planter names. And all of this stuff is stemming from the plantation, in my view. And it's also stemming from the fact that it's a relatively small local community and people are marrying each other. And I'm finding people <coughs> blinking to me on multiple, multiple levels from this, just as uh, Michelle was just talking about. <laughs> so by this timeline, we see the generation four matches could be mostly from the plantation period. And I'm sure this is going to affect a lot of us. I mean, those of us that are a bit younger or have very, very tight generational gaps, it might be completely gone. But those of us that are a bit older and have longer generational gaps, this will certainly be present. So now on to my Y67 Y chromosome STR matches. And first thing I'll point out is you have here three guns and gill guns. These are the same name. Um, there is a Caithness gun and these don't figure on this at all because the Maca guns and the guns and Fermanagh and Calvin are distinct native Irish population compared to the Caithness guns in Scotland. Although there are people in one side that think they're in the other and vice versa. The other thing you see is Boylan, McConnell, Cairns, Kelly, and more McConnell. And you see their locations. And uh, Morris, there, there are actually some. Boylan. I was thinking more in terms of there are Farrells in here as well. All oh, right. Which you might want to take a look at later. But this, this is the SMP3 that all these guys are on. I've, I've assigned it relatively loosely and I haven't pinned it down. But you experts will know what this means and you'll be able to figure out what this is. Um, so then, what's Clan Kelly? Clan Kelly originated from Kelly, who died in 732 AD, who was the king of the <coughs> Ucremefin, and believed to be descended from Colla da Krish. Now, Kelly's grandson, Don, will give rise to the name MacDonald in the area, and laterally, the McGonalls and the McConnells. And this, was, this name change to McGonnell and McConnell was essentially done to distinguish them from the Scottish McDonalds. So two people with the same name, we want to make a distinction between the two of them, and this is what happened here. So if we come on to the, the slide again, we'll actually see these guys are there. And uh, Kelly also led to the O'Lorcan Summo Flanagans, which is where Boylan comes in, the O'Kellys, O'Donnells, O'Cairns, and the O'Harts and the Mulroonies. So there we see we got the gun, we got the boiling, we got the McConnell, we got the Cairns, the O'Kelly, the McConnell. I mean, there's a few people that haven't tested and are therefore not there, but this is pretty much representative of these names from the Clan Kerry Barony, which was described in the 2005 article by Shigo again. So I, a couple of weeks ago, I was coming across links to the oh, sorry Fitzpatrick's, and I uploaded my data to the or to the Fitzpatrick um, group on Family Tree DNA, and they were extremely interested in it because they were thinking that this earlier data set is helping them understand where they got the name Magilla Patrick from, because they weren't always son of Pat, the follower of Patrick. 
because the SNP group that's characterising myself and the Kellys and the McConnells and the Kearns's is that related to the Fitzpatricks of Orsori. And if we go down to a very low resolution of 12 markers, there are actually Fitzpatricks that start to appear, although I don't place a whole lot of trust in that. But the last of the Osorian kings was Donal Magillapatrick, and the fourth, I think, and he was driven out of his fortress from the site of Kilkenny Castle by the Normans in 1170. So potentially they've moved up north to get away from the Normans. Potentially. So could these be Clan Kelly foremen, Osorians, uh, who moved to Ulster to get away from the Normans, rather than Clan Collar descendants? So next on to the, the emigres van William van Aranya, and this is not so much a genetic but rather a, a genealogical thing, just to illustrate that people from the Williamite Wars did end up in Fermanagh. And it's a little bit humorous as well. So this is one particular family tree that I did relatively recently at the end of last year. Uh, it was the family of Joost, who was a Dutch soldier in Ireland. He arrived in 18, sorry, 1689, but we don't see any record of him until, or his ancestors, or his descendants, until 1772 in Wicklow, where he was a coast guard. Then appeared in Westport and County Mayo, another coast guard, and then Cork and Kerry, and then eventually in 1934, one of them married a girl from my hometown who was the daughter of the acting RIC sergeant. So it's a very small world. So I have a, a quiz for you. We are talking about here a literary Williamite descendant who was coming from a Dutch colonel who arrived with the forces of Willem van Aranya. He was educated at Pretoria Royal School and wrote praise. Who is it? Anybody know? Sheriff. Sure. Again? No. 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 Exactly. Oscar Wilde. Now, in Dutch, his name would be Wilde. But over here we call him Wilde for some reason. Right, so that's more or less it. Um, thanks very much for your attention. Uh, the acknowledgements are Morris and Jared for running the show today and having me speak. Michael for helping me with the slides. Uh, Bado and de Kromberger de Loringa with a little bit of his information on the Menapians. And these guys here did the um, assignments of the SMPs. Uh, this is Peter Biggins et al, who worked on the three colours. Mike Fitzpatrick for the information on the Fitzpatrick link. Uh, Rick O'Kelly for information on the Kelly link. Sean Corr and Veronica Riley and others in Fermanagh for uploading their data and for useful discussions. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and any questions. Thank you very much, Cahill. Um, where do you think the research is going to go next? So where are we going to be in 10 years' time, do you think? Because you've painted a lot of very tantalizing uh, connections, but where do they, how do you think the state of play will be in 10 years' time? I would imagine in 10 years' time we'd have pinned all of this down, because mm -hmm. more people would have tested, and we would know exactly what the SNP lineages are and where everybody's from. Mm -hmm. And we may even integrate it in with ancient DNA or more recent uh, buried uh, samples so we can see where this was in Belgium and this was where and so on. And are there many of them around for Man and Monaghan? Not sure. Not, Not sure. Not sure. Get digging in the garden. <laughs> see if you can find them. Uh, questions for Cahill? Jared. Uh, just a few points. Uh, uh, a local historian in Fermanagh, John Cunningham, who was very helpful to me in my, my research. And he's written 20 uh, local history books, including a lot of the ancient settlements and things like that. There is a legend that uh, a Scythian warrior stepped ashore on Loch Gern at uh, Boa Island. And the, the Janus figures there are pre-Christian mm. pagan. So there's very, very interesting stories around there. On the three colors, they were DF21, which is also the same branch as the bell beaker, who was found up in Rutland Island. So I'm just wondering if there's a connection there. Yeah. And, and they moved south eventually, and they gave rise to the Eli O'Carrolls, uh, who are 
neighbours of the Megalopatras. Hmm. I mean, the other thing I forgot to mention was that the Neolithic people brought RM269 with them, and 80% of the population in this island are RM269 descendants. And even that some of the invaders from England and the continent would also have been that as well. So we still have a lot of people on the same mm. branch, same trunk, mm -hmm. but actually having different branches. Mm -hmm. Any questions? We're going to um, have a, uh, well, we were going to have a panel discussion afterwards, but I think we might as well have it now and just kind of continue into the panel discussion so that you can ask any question that uh, you like about uh, DNA, because I know a lot of people uh, are still fairly new to DNA and probably uh, have learned a lot today, but there's still a lot of other questions that still remain. So if you have any questions about uh, any aspect of DNA, we'll um, answer them uh, now in the next uh, 10 to 20 minutes or so. So um, does, they, uh, does anybody have any particular questions about DNA that they, they want to, to ask anything, anything at all? There's stunned stun silence <laughs> in the room. Just no one wants to go digest from what's been done. There's a lot of digestion that will be required after this weekend, I'm sure. <laughs> How many people have actually done a DNA test? <coughs> so a lot of people, and uh, all of you are in the North of Ireland Family History Society mm -hmm. and the DNA project there? That's, no? Okay, well anyone who buys a test downstairs gets automatic uh, inclusion in the North of Ireland DNA project. So that's uh, very, very useful because they have 3,000 people in the database from the North of Ireland. So if you're particularly interested in connecting with cousins within the North of Ireland, then uh, being part of that DNA project is going to be very, very helpful for you. Um, the other thing to note is that they do do courses as well. So every uh, four weeks or so, they do a new, a new three-week course. They meet every Tuesday for two or three hours in the evening, and they take you through uh, the actual DNA test itself uh, what your matches mean, and then finish on the third week by uploading your matches to GEDmatch so that you get access to the two databases rather than just the one. So um, do go down to the North of Ireland Family History Stand uh, downstairs if, that's, um, if you haven't actually joined the society as yet. You don't have to join the society to join the project, the DNA project, but I think you get a lot of additional um, benefits from joining the North of Ireland Family History Society. So, um, question here from Michael Carroll. Michael is is there a, a course online for uh, Genesis? I know, I know that the, the, the website itself gives you all, some information. But That's a good question. Um, so Jake, Donna? No, I don't think there is. There used to be a really good video by Kitty, I think, who did a blog and a video that showed you exactly how to use Gizmet. I don't think anyone's done in one for the Genesis. What's but if you go to the ISOL wiki page, there's a specific w wiki page with all the links about GEDmatch, okay. and there's some links there to the videos and blogs and things people have written, but I, I haven't seen anything specifically on Genesis. Yeah. Yeah. But GEDmatch would do for, for now too. That's yeah, right. yeah. Go to the ISOL wiki page, and there's lots of really good links on there to blogs. One of my, one of my <coughs> blogs is on there about GEDmatch basics as well. It's quite old now, but... Okay, uh, any other questions? Donna, you might as well come up here and, and sit at the front so that we can have, have, a, uh, have something that looks like a panel anyway. <laughs> um, so just to introduce people, we have Jared Corcoran here who's been doing the, uh, the Facebook streaming all uh, day. Thank you very much for that, Jared. We then have Cahill Machelgun, of course, whom you know uh, from the previous presentation, and Donna Rutherford, who gave the uh, first presentation here uh, this morning. So um, I think I'm going to start uh, with uh, your, your, yourself, Donna, and I'm going to ask you a question, and that will help generate some interesting discussion and stimulate uh, some questions from the audience as well. But um, we've obviously come a long way with genetic genealogy, and especially in Ireland as well, where between uh, the Dublin and Belfast shows, there's a lot of people who are actually doing uh, the DNA testing now, and a lot of people are um, finding uh, connections. Where would you like to see 
this in five years' time? Where do you think we will be in five years' time? And Debbie Kennett is joining us as well. What, what, because people are now uh, doing a lot more with their DNA, there's been a lot available online, people are learning, people want to go to the next step. What I'd like to see is when we do shows like this, we actually do workshop style shows where you can come along with your problem or maybe even mail in your problem a few weeks early or maybe a couple of months early and say we're coming to the show, we want to book some time on the workshop and we pick up three or four of those problems and actually workshop them with you over the, over the course of the show. So it's, that, that's what I personally like to do. Would you find that helpful do you think? Having workshops here where you can actually sit down with an expert, show them your your iPad or a little bit of a printout and try and work on your own uh, particular conundrum. So that's something that we would like to see. Um, what, el what other things would people like to see at these type of events? Because I'm just aware that uh, sitting in the audience and hearing an hour lecture followed by an hour lecture for six hours can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, what other uh, things would you like to see at these type of events? Because that would actually help us in, in the planning uh, for these type of events. Yes, gentleman here. Well, I sort of wonder about, well, the whole business is about connecting to other people, uh, other people who are our relatives. Now, this is a room of other people. And I come along to these things and I think to myself, you know, I, I, perhaps I resonate a bit more, you know, when I'm close to them, you know, that person or the other person or whatever. And all, is, is, the, is it, is it the, the, the crimson eight or is it, is it 21 or what, which, what's doing it? And I'm sort of wondering about the connectedness that could happen at these meetings, you know, I mean, even just uh, having a, a name tag, because we do get to know names very well, because we spend half mm -hmm. our lives sort of <laughs> seeing names with really strange people who don't exist, but, but you know, they're there in so many city moments. But, but all, I, I just wonder about that possible mm -hmm. connectedness that might happen at these events. Has anyone seen that happen at any uh, events or conferences that they've been at? An app. An app. An it's app. Like an app, an app. <laughs> oh, Jared. Oh, uh, there, there is um, an app which I use all the time now. You can nearly go to a conference every single day if you want to. There's, there's a platform called Event Right, okay? Mm -hmm. They have interesting conferences nearly every day. Most of them free, right? Which you can sign up for. Uh, and, and in pretty much all of them, they give you a barcode so you can be scanned in, you know, and connect a little network between people so that you can discuss things and so on and so forth. So that's, I, I, we talked about it yesterday, and I think maybe in one of the future uh, conferences we will implement that. Um, somebody jokingly said Tinder at the uh, back of the room, but um, could we actually have a DNA uh, app, a, t a Tinder app that included uh, DNA matches? <laughs> Would anybody like to talk about Decode Me and the situation in Iceland? Because that app actually exists. Uh, in, in Iceland, they've practically tested the entire population. And the Icelandic genealogies are very, very good. And they have documentation that goes back sometimes to the 900s, which is absolutely incredible. But because everybody is um, relatively closely related in uh, Iceland, what some entrepreneur has done is taken this genealogical data and um, the, uh, I'm not sure if they've used DNA data, they must have used DNA data as well, but taken the genealogical data and built an app so that if you're chatting up a blonde at the bar, you can knock phones together and an alarm goes off if you're too closely related. <laughs> So, so, the, so the idea of a Tinder app is actually not a bad idea at all. Yes, at the back. Uh, we were talking about this yesterday, and we were thinking of uh, where you get rock bands and the tours down the back of your T-shirt. You put all the surnames down the back of a T-shirt. Oh. Everybody that comes to the conference puts a T-shirt on. No, that would be really, really good if you actually had a T-shirt with all of your ancestral names written on your back, or your front, as the case may be. Regarding the uh, Icelandic one, was it Saracens did that? They were paid to do it, and then I think that the information is not. It was accepted. it was Decode Me that actually was the company that did the uh, the work in Iceland. Uh, Sorensen was a different database. The Sorensen Molecular Genetic Foundation set that up, um, and they had uh, they eventually sold that database to Ancestry. 
and then um, Ancestry uh, closed that down because they found out that it was just had too much public um, exposure and uh, so they wanted to close it down for privacy reasons and they still have that database at Ancestry and they still use it internally but the um, data in that database is not publicly available anymore and of course that's one of the big uh, risks in this industry is that you don't know how long the databases are going to be active for. Um, we can think of Scotland's people uh, which closed down or Britain's DNA Britain's DNA, rather, and Scot Scotland's people DNA. Scotland's, Scotland's DNA. people is not closed down. That's the website. Scotland's <laughs> DNA, Britain's <laughs> DNA, uh, Yorkshire DNA. Uh, they were all under the same company. Oh, They've yes, all DNA. and Ireland's all DNA. That all closed down. <laughs> We've also lost a uh, public da uh, database, Y Search. We've also lost the public database, Mito Search. Although new ones have come in to replace that. Um, so we do have to be strike while the iron is hot and while those databases are there we should be doing uh, getting the most out of them that we possibly can um, moving along then Cahill uh, where do you where would you like to see us in five years time mm, it's, a, it's a tricky question um, we could potentially be next generation sequencing next Everything. generation sequencing however there are <coughs> privacy concerns with that that makes me cautious about it, but it would be certainly infinitely more effective in analysis, if, if, especially if the tools came along with it, to find similarities. We certainly would be able to get rid of a lot of the false positive yes. segments that we probably have in our results. Yes. When you do um, whole genome sequencing, which is not just looking at the 700,000 SNPs that we're currently looking at with the commercial tests that we've all done, but you're looking at three billion uh, letters in your genome and comparing it to the three billion letters in everybody else's. So there's a lot less chance that you'll get false positives with this new type of, of testing. But in order to do that, you're looking at tests that were a thousand, more than a thousand dollars, then they came down below a thousand dollars. Now you can get them really cheap for how much, Debbie? What was the? One hundred and ninety-nine dollars. Yeah, for Dante. Yeah. So one hundred and ninety-nine dollars yeah, for, for Dante. Mm. And when you think about it, the first human genome cost three point seven billion dollars, and it took ten years. Mm -hmm. Now it's down to one hundred and ninety-nine dollars um, a few hours. But that was a one-off. That was a one-off. Yeah. And yeah. it's not it's inferior technology, I understand, yeah. compared to the Lumina. And how long, and um, Jared will direct this to you, how long, if we do do whole genome sequencing, how long before we build comparative databases that reach critical mass and are as good as the 30 million we have in the current commercial databases? Well, you know, the reason you can buy for $199 today in terms of data is much more valuable than the cost of sequencing, right? And the people who sequence it, whether they be healthcare companies or uh, for example, the business model of Helix is to sell you uh, the initial sequencing for a very low cost, maybe $50, and give you part of your analysis. And then as you need other parts throughout the lifetime of your genome, which lasts your, your entire life, you can buy additional parts of the analysis, okay? But the data is so valuable that I would expect within a few years, it would be free of charge. That, that the uh, you know the, the human the, the national genome projects in Ireland we have uh, GMI which is Genomics Medicine Ireland in England it's uh, Genomics England and so on and so forth. Uh, I would imagine they would uh, have programs to sequence the genome free of charge. So that kind of brings us to to your uh, view of where are we going to be in five years time because the, the, the promise of personalized yes. medicine has been held out to us like a, a carrot at the end of a stick for a long time. Are we actually realizing that presently, or are we not there yet? Well, the, the, the problem is, that even as you look at all the very interesting presentations we have uh, these two days, it's still very complex. We need to make the technology disappear. Right? It needs to fade into the background. And as long as anyone can pick up an, up an app, uh, analyze your DNA, do useful stuff, find uh, uh, matches, 
uh, find their ancient ancestors and things like that. Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, it will take a while to do that, probably about 10 years. Mm -hmm. I think that's where I would like to see it happen. As regards the rollout, you know, the National Genome Projects are way ahead of their targets. In Ireland, we had a target of, of, of uh, 40,000, right? And that's just been increased to 500,000. That's 10% of the population. Uh, in the UK, uh, Debbie can comment, they've probably expanded beyond the initial targets. Yes, we've got, um, well, genomics medicine, will be the, uh, 100,000 genomes in England, they, they're now rolling out a program on the NHS where you can pay to have your genome sequenced through the NHS but contribute your results to science. So they're trying to get 5 million people in population sequenced, and I, I presume that's extended to Northern Ireland as well. I would, I would hope it is. Um, and then we've also got UK Biobank, um, and which, which I'm a part of, which is half a million people in the UK who um, have had their, their, they're currently doing the whole genome sequencing on that, but they're also combining that with National Health Service records. Um, I had to go for like a two hour uh, visit to have all sorts of metrics taken. I had to do all sorts of things on a computer. I had to have my urine tested, my blood sample tested, and they did lung function and uh, heart rate. And then I even had a, like a week where I had to wear a Fitbit on my arm and that got sent off. And that's produced a massive amount of data because the, it's the first big data set that's ever been made available to scientists. And it's now given that chance to, to mine that huge data set to try and work out uh, if there is a genetic component to all sorts of things, whether it's just height or um, you know, whether it's a, a particular condition, a disease. But it's much more complicated than anyone ever thought, and there's many more factors involved, and there's still so much of it is environmental rather than, uh, than genetic. So your DNA is never going to determine your destiny, so much as it's your environment as well. The speed of change in this whole frontier over the last five years, let alone ten years, is just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, it's kind of outstripping our ability to imagine what can happen in the future. Um, and we've seen, obviously, applications by um, uh, law enforcement in the US for, for identifying murder victims, catching serial killers. We've seen how uh, personalized medicine is just getting bigger and bigger, and they're creating these massive big databases. Um, we've also seen how it helps adoptees uh, get reconnected with their birth families. And there's a lot of very, very um, positive stories that come out of these new applications that had not been initially envisaged. So uh, I'm just wondering what, what, what you think, maybe starting with you, Debbie, um, where are we going to be in five years' time that we can't even imagine today? Well, I think one of the things to say is that there's been a lot of talk about DNA being behind all these things, but in fact it's not DNA itself. Um, when you think about adoption searches, law enforcement, um, DNA only plays a very small part of it, and there's not really any DNA information that's being revealed. The, the, what is really happening is we've got all these big data sets coming together all at once. So when I first started doing my family history, I had to look through all the in indexes for birth, marriages and deaths. I used to go to my local record office, get one microfiche out at a time. Now I just put all the names in to pre-BMD, I can search names on Ancestry or find my past, and I can find information about any living person today, when they were born, when they were married, when they died. I can go on Facebook, I can find out all sorts of things about families and their relationships. And none of these things would be possible without that expansion of online genealogical data. So I think we're going to have a sort of sea change where people have to think about what data they're sharing um, and making available online and how that impacts other family members. And I think DNA is just one small component of that very much bigger picture. I mean, Donna, you uh, are an expert in cloud technology. Um, do you think we'd be able to do what we've done with DNA without that kind of cloud technology behind it? No, it, it's not just the, the cloud technology is just a way of storing data, but it's the, it's the big data and the ability to store big data now and to have a way to access that data and pull information. And what's happening with things like d DNA, you know, some people worry that they've got DNA in perhaps a big database, but 
when people are, are accessing this big data, they're not necessarily, they're not looking for names, they're not doing genealogy like we are, they're looking for patterns in the data and how they can use data to maybe, um, you, you know, look for uh, healthcare, want it to, to, to look for how we can um, help with diseases and so on, so, and people are looking for that information, and it's the same in the in the rest of the world where, you know, if you're using um, bus cards or, you know, like an Oyster card in, in London, um, other your credit cards even, people are mining all this big, all this data is available and people are mining it to sell you things um, or to, um, to try and, and uh, gain some benefit by knowing this information about the population as a whole. And so DNA is just going to get, it's just by extension part of all this big data um, that's available, but it's not necessarily available by person. And I think that's why some people get really worried about big data. It's, it's almost, a it's, it, people aren't looking for one person, they're looking for patterns and, and all those, and all that data. Well, they are, I think one of the most invasive things is actually like supermarket loyalty cards, where they are looking for data for an individual and trying to market things specifically to you based on your, your your shopping habits, for example. So if I go to Boots, they know exactly what I'm buying there or to Waitrose or Tesco's or wherever. And they, they can build up a picture of you and your lifestyle. They, they probably know more about your health than your doctor does just by your you know the diet and by the what you buy every week in, in the, the supermarket. And they, you know, they can work out your age, how many people you've got in your family, whether you're buying nappies or sanitary products or you know, all sorts of things like that. Um, what medication you're picking up when you go to Boots. Um, so all, all these big stores have far more big data on individuals than any, um, say, genealogy company or DNA company does. But they're also managing that by the technology. So it's not someone sitting behind the behind the curtain going, Debbie Kennett's coming in, let's get all those things <laughs> 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 the front door. <laughs> <laughs> she needs eggs and beans. <laughs> maybe it is really not Debbie. <laughs> um, but actually it's the, it's the technology that's working in the back mm -hmm. end to, to put that information out to you. There is a, it's not done by, by people. People are certainly making those, those programs, but all that information is coming to you because the technology can work out who you are. It's not a group of people who are working out who you are. Well, that has interesting implications for ancestry and genealogy because uh, obviously uh, Ancestry being the biggest company, Ancestry.com being the biggest company, it, has, uh, it uses big data in a very, um, very important way. Um, I'm just wondering, what do you think is going to happen in the next five years with Ancestry when they go from 30 million to 60 million people DNA tested, when people are starting to, to, to more and more put up their trees on Ancestry? Will we actually be in a situation where somebody does a DNA test and Ancestry gives them a, a report that says, here's 56% of your ancestors, now just go away and find out the other 44%? Yeah, that absolutely is going to happen. Uh, and there's no doubt about it, and because uh, with the, my pioneer family, my, my mum's pioneer family, so many of them have DNA tested now, and I've built out all their trees because I've had to do that to figure out who some of these matches were. And literally, if I get a match to mum and it's one of the pioneer families, I can put them in my tree straight away. I know exactly who they are and where they fit uh, because all that's been built. And you're right, that's going to happen with Ancestry. Um, they're going, you're going to do a DNA test, they're going to give you a family tree. You will then need to go and verify it, but they're going to say, here's a hint for you, it's your entire tree, but you verify how much of it is right. Sure. Question here. Can, can I ask, if that's the future, <coughs> can we first have an algorithm that will correct the wrong trees that are out there? <laughs> <laughs> Especially in Ancestry. Well, one thing that Ancestry is doing, I don't think many big people are aware of it, they're building this big tree from all their user data. And in fact, when you have, when you have com big computers aggregating information, it can actually be really powerful and can spot mistakes. So a computer can easily spot if a birth and death data out by 100 years and can correct for that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what we need to do is to crowdsource the family trees and make sure the trees have good sources. So <coughs> rather than everyone working on their own individual tree, we should all be working like Wikipedia to produce mm -hmm. good, uh, one good big family <coughs> tree. So for every person that's ever lived, the family search are trying to do the same. We have a really good record for that person 
and all backed up by sources, but not on everyone's <coughs> computers, but on one big central resource. It may be two big central resources. How, how many people use Wikitree? Few. <coughs> how, many, how many people use Genie? <coughs> and how many people use the family search tree? This is a few. Okay, so h how do you think, how effective do you think those trees are? Has anybody got a, um, a, uh, an idea? From a, for, for if, you, if you're researching, uh, researching a match, I mean, those trees are incredibly helpful because, you, you know, I, I actually find that a lot of them are, are actually more correct than what you think they are. Um, and maybe I've just been lucky, but actually when I've been quickly building up trees for my matches, pretty much if I take the hints and just build up whatever's there online, I, f I find my ancestor, and you start to then work backwards to <coughs> make sure everything's properly sourced, and they're not as bad as, as people think. But of course it's in the company's best interest to start getting these trees right, because if they want to sell us the ability of do a DNA test, we'll produce your family tree, that it, that's good. That's not good marketing if they do that. Everyone goes, well, that's a load of crap. So, you know, crap in, crap out is something we always say in technology. It's just the language. <laughs> 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 Rubbish in. Um, yeah. So it's in everyone's best interest to get these these things right. And that comment here. Yeah, I sure. think that kind of a thing. In ancestry, if you can have people collaborating on family trees and stuff, and you have to be very careful who you give permission to, because there are some people and they will just cut and paste and they. Yeah kind of just go off in this crazy stuff and take, take so much work <coughs> to undo the kind of misinformation they put in. I'm, I'm inclined to be a bit of a control freak when it comes to the trees, and I get people to send me the information at this stage because it's just... But if you have a situation like genie.com, where it's a collaborative tree, you have administrators who have yeah. responsibility for individual people on those trees, and you can't add extra data <coughs> if it's wrong and if it's yeah. not backed up by sources. Mm. It's much more difficult to control that if it's a private tree, but if it's a public tree where you've got a lot of people collaborating together, you've got much more chance of coming up with some good results. I mean, like, like a Wikipedia is a r now a really brilliant mm. resource. It, okay, so it's 100% <coughs> really accurate, but it's a really good starting point for any subject that you want, and that's to a purely collaborative um, process. It's been going on for the last 10 years or more. It's Gentleman over here. Um, I just want to know, um, how is a DNA test done? Does it involve needles? <laughs> How is a DNA test done? Does it involve needles? Um, it can do if you want it. But uh, <coughs> I would recommend the swab, just swabbing your cheek like that, or you can do a spit test and spit into a test tube. So that's the, the two main ways that DNA is actually done. Most well, you can do it from blood tests as well, but that's more on the medical side of things. Most yeah. of the precision medicine ones are blood tests. Yeah. Most of the precision medicine ones are blood tests. If you are, have an elderly grandmother, for example, mm -hmm. sometimes old people find it very difficult to get enough saliva to spit into the tube. In that situation, the swab test is probably a better one to go for. And Michelle, you had a comment on that as yeah, well? No, not on that. Actually, I wanted to go back to the trees. Oh, the trees. Okay. Um, and it, it reminded me of something I actually forgot to say in my presentation um, when I was talking about uh, master trees on ancestry and the like. Can we stand up and just turn around so we can let the audience hear? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, basically, with the trees, obviously, there's you know there's thousands and thousands of trees on ancestry and. There's lots of errors in trees prior to DNA, but we're finding more now that people are building very quick and dirty uh, speculative trees to help with DNA matching. And a lot of these trees are um, being left public and thrown out there and then they get copied and the mistakes is like Chinese whispers. Um, and of course that's what happens you know, before DNA as well, but it's just escalated um, with uh, the, D the trees that people are creating for DNA matches. So what I always tell people to do when they're creating these quick and dirty and speculative trees is to make the trees private and unsearchable, and then they can't be seen by anyone else in the Ancestry database apart from you or someone you give access to. Um, and that just would help clean all of that up a bit. All of my trees, master trees, etc., are all private and unsearchable. Nobody's gonna see any of that because I might be doing very speculative things on these trees, um, I, I'm not looking for um, sources as, uh, as much as I would if I'm doing traditional genealogy. I'm just quickly trying to see if I can find common ancestors. And so there will 
potentially be errors that I don't want other people seeing. So it's always best to keep it private and unsearchable. And often people make them private, but they don't realize how you can go and make them unsearchable. And you just need to go into the settings as an extra click, and then you need to look down and tick the box to make them unsearchable. We had a comment there from Paddy on that point. A little more cynical about the ancestry procedure. I do recall the first time I signed up for an ancestry account, I was invited to start my tree. And if you don't know, please just guess. <laughs> <laughs> that is not the way to no. introduce a beginner into making a tree that is going to be sold on to all their other customers. And I'm not sure about Michelle's point about making it unsearchable and unseeable because Ancestry internally is doing the data mining to find here is a, an individual, probably even in a private unsearchable tree, to which the researcher has linked these 10 records. So when somebody else comes to one of those 10 records, Ancestry is going to provide the other nine as a hint. The, big, the second big problem after the beginners please guess is the hint system, which is the worst computer virus I have ever seen, <laughs> because when somebody puts in, wrong information, like my granny was born uh, 20 years after I was, that information goes viral by generating hints for other users. There's no quality control on the hints. The hints are not checked for viability relative to dates, or they're not checked against primary sources. So if there was actually a human in Ancestry checking all these things before generating the hints, it would work more like Wikipedia, but it's working exactly the opposite way at the moment. It probably will improve in time, I would imagine. Um, and I think, you know, thinking forward to maybe five years' time, when there's maybe 60 million people in the database, maybe even more than that, and we have people doing more accurate trees and creating more accurate trees, and Ancestry has improved its own internal algorithms and statistical processes for generating hints that are accurate, we're going to end up in a situation where, just like you were saying, Debbie, we have one big tree with more and more branches being added to it all the time. Now, that presents opportunities, but it also presents challenges. So I'm just wondering from you, Paddy, what do you think Ancestry is going to do with that information in five years' time when there's 60 million people with DNA in their database and they know how they're all connected in a big one-world tree? Somebody, but probably not Ancestry, will try and automate what we've been talking about for the last two days. Everything that has been talked about for the last two days is presumably capable of ultimately being automated. It's probably Johnny Pearl behind you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but unless Ancestry is convinced that there's money in it, they're not going to go down that road, and nobody has convinced them that there's money in making the user tree accurate. Well, well the you know, the, the Jared, industry, Jared. Uh, I've heard various numbers, it's probably about a two, two billion dollar industry. Or whatever. Two billion dollar industry, yeah. the, project. The healthcare industry is a ten trillion dollar industry, wow. right? Yeah. Now, Ancestry, I understand some of the markers are medical informative markers, they're not reported, right? But, but they could be used. And, you know, it, it, it doesn't take any leap of the imagination to think that Ancestry would be tempted to collaborate with the healthcare uh, industry. And, and what would that look like, do you think? And what kind of effects would that have on medical, medicine in general, pharmaceutical developments in particular? When, when you get up to 60 million uh, data sets, then these become extremely useful for machine learning, artificial intelligence, and we already have the convergence of cloud and uh, um, cloud and big data and, and so on and so forth. When you bring in genomics into that, it becomes very, very powerful. If you look at you know, reading X-ray scans or MRI scans, two years ago, it had to be a human. Today, it's more accurate to do it with a machine, using machine learning, artificial intelligence. The same thing will happen with uh, genealogy to a certain extent. I'm wondering if, if Johnny could create a chatbot, you know, which goes through and interviews people so we get, avoid all the problems that Paddy mentioned, you know, and that would be very useful. And in terms of uh, medical developments, I mean, are we going to live longer because of the DNA we're giving to these companies today? 
For sure. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. How? Why? <laughs> um, who? First of all, who wants to live longer than you know? <laughs> so what? What do you think? Well, that's the. Yeah, do you want to live longer? Very true. Very true. Um, There's a term called longevity escape velocity, right? Longevity means, escape velocity. What does that mean? If you reach a certain age, where prog medical progress can prolong life by one year longer than the time it takes. That means for next year, they'll prolong it two years. Then you have reached longevity escape velocity. Um, but how they long? Say that'll happen within thirty years. Within thirty years, we'll be able to live forever. No, no well, at sure. least one hundred and fifty. Yeah. Yeah. At least one hundred and fifty. <laughs> and that's how long away? Thirty years. Thirty years. So in thirty years' time, we'll all be living till one hundred and fifty. <laughs> so there'll be plenty of time to do your family tree. Yeah. <laughs> Except it'll all be automated, so you won't have well, to. Well, that's the other thing, right? <laughs> it, it will all be automated. And and I know the fun I used to have with spreadsheets, a lot of that stuff I, is, is now automated, and you lose some of that real fun because it's too quick almost and too easy. Uh, so we need something new to, to do. Well, I, I, I miss going to a library and <laughs> just uh, getting the smell of the parchment and the leather on yeah. the old books. Yeah, I, um, that's what happened. The microfiche. Yeah. And <laughs> um, all those days sitting in front of the microfiche getting seasick, which you, know, you don't have to do anymore. <laughs> do make, they used to make me seasick. Um, but yeah, um, things have moved on. In fact, D DNA testing is almost like though it, it's, it's like when we went from travelling around the world to go to records offices and everything came online and people were like, we don't believe it if it's online. It's, it's impossible. If you found it on the internet, it can't be right. You know, they still wanted to go to a records office. And now people, there's so many genealogists now that don't even believe you have to go to an archive office or a record office. They don't realise what they're missing out on because they just think you find it on Ancestry and you build, you know, I've had someone say, well, you know, I've been doing my genealogy for five weeks and I've finished my family tree. What do I do next? <laughs> yeah, some people actually think that that can happen. And, uh, so we're losing that fun of... Well, I read, I think it's the National Archives in the UK, um, they've only digitised something like 2% yes. of their entire collection. And they've got a huge yeah. amount that's it's online, but they're focusing yeah. only on the most commonly used records. So there's a huge amount of treasure there that's still waiting to be uncovered. And similarly and with family search, family search as well, I think they've only uh, digitized 10% of the mm -hmm. records that they have in that big underground chamber in a mountain in Utah. A lot of the records that are digitized are unindexed, yeah. you know, so yeah. you have to... You yeah. actually have to yeah. look through the microfiche online. online. Yeah. 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 And there's, there's <coughs> gems in there, yeah. but, uh, but if people can't, you know, put it in the search box and then have it pop up, then... They don't, they don't notice that that's even there. So do you think that um, standard genealogy, documentary de genealogy, is going to die out mm -hmm. relatively in the next five or ten years? Or Not ten years, no. How long would you give it? Oh God, I mean, that's, that's some prediction, but, you know, I'd hope up to 50 years, but it could, it could be earlier than that. But, yeah, it, it is, it's not going to be the same as it is now, for sure. Um, but we have to do everything we can to preserve the archives that we have um, and at least make sure everything does get digitized in case you know we lose them at some point. I, yeah, I don't think there's going to be any major <coughs> decrease in, in the, the need for documentary research. Mm -hmm. um, in the, it will still be there in five or ten years' time because we still have so much to digitize and index and put online. And then, of course, gravestones as well. We need to go out and photograph all those gravestones and get that digitized and indexed and put online as well. So there's still a lot still to be done, and that's where big data is really going to help us. Well, the, the other thing about that is people don't understand the cost of trying to put records online. It's multi-millions of, of pounds to digitize and get records online. And, and people are constantly wanting to look, well, where can I go to get that for free? I don't want to buy a certificate anymore. Yep. I just want to find this for free. And if we stop wanting to buy things um, and geneal online genealogy uh, documentation, the there's going to be no money to fund this continuing the digitization. digitization. Won't happen. It's one of those things I get I get asked very often, and I see very often people complaining about the fact that the English and Welsh uh, marriages 
you can't buy them as PDFs. And the reason for that is because they ran out of money when they were doing the, uh, the digitization <laughs> of the births and the deaths. Yes. They got to the, the deaths and they didn't, they, they ran out of money and they stopped the project before they, in, they digitized the marriages. So they simply <coughs> don't have them to offer as PDFs, but every week you will see someone complain, why can't I get a marriage as a PDF? And that's the reason. They didn't, they, and there's no money being found to go back and do it. So I, I did actually li literally work on some of that project in, in IT, and that was, it was millions and millions and millions of pounds was spent <coughs> on that project. And it's just a mess of documentation uh, out there and needs to be done. Yep. And you have to automate the process. I think someone did work out how long it would take for someone to stand there and actually scan everything, and it was an army of people over hundreds of years. Yeah. So, so it will take know, a very long time to get everything digitised, yeah, basically. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's a similar thing happening in <coughs> academia. We've seen it with ancient DNA coming in and overwriting, overwriting the archaeologists and the linguists and the historians and sometimes trying to rewrite history and there's been a backlash against that and there's been a good debate opened up about what it all means and uh, yeah I, I think we'll have something similar happening in in genetic genealogy and traditional genealogy and mm. and they will find a happy medium <coughs> and you have to have, have more cooperation happening between the two well, if we are all going to live for 150 years, thanks to the tests we've done at Ancestry and Family Tree DNA, um, and it is going to deliver 56% of our ancestors to us as soon as we do the test, um, what other uh, potential applications are there for this far greater connectivity? So, for example, with the North of Ireland Family uh, DNA Project, you know, with 3,000 people in there, uh, Martin McDowell is uh, currently uh, calculating that that uh, means that they probably have DNA from about 30% of the population of Ulster in the 1750s. So that's 30%. Is that's, that's just going to keep on getting higher and higher and higher so that uh, eventually maybe it, it could take two or three years, but it'll be close to 100% of the population of the 1750s here in Ulster will have some DNA represented in that DNA project. And that's going to increase the connectivity between the people in the project. So I'm wondering if that is going to have or translate into uh, some kind of social change that when we realize that we're all that much greater connectivity between us, what's going to happen socially? Is it going to change the way that we think about each other? Is it going to make uh, Christmas uh, a much bigger affair. Uh, what's going to happen? Any, any thoughts, any ideas about the social implications of ancestry? Well, one which interests me a lot, of course, is connecting the diaspora. And here in Ireland, we have 5 million people. And abroad, we have 80 million people who are part of the diaspora. And connecting that, I think, is very powerful. Uh, second one, you know, you, you have different ways from Northern Ireland, you have the Scots-Irish which went early, you know, the Daniel Boone type uh, um, uh, settlers and pioneers in, in, in the Americas, and then you had the famine immigrants and are from different communities, and I think connecting those back together will be very powerful, I think. It'll be good for tourism as well. Uh, Paddy? Again, I think we're looking at it in a very different way to the way Ancestry is looking at it. A tiny proportion of Ancestry's 12 million people have researched their family tree or attached a family tree to their DNA. Ancestry is telling them this is about our ethnicity percentage estimates. It's not telling them that it's all about changing society and making bigger families and bigger <coughs> Christmas parties. But if Ancestry went out there and marketed it in that way, perhaps it would happen. But that's not why they're doing it. Where do you think Ancestry will be in five years' time, and what will their interests be, given the fact that they are a company owned by venture capitalists? Well, their interest is in making money, mm -hmm. and we have to convince them that doing the things we would like to see will make them money, and then they do them. I think they were quite surprised at how successful the DNA uh, was, because initially, uh, from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong or if you've heard all, uh, otherwise, they introduced the DNA in order to attract more people into the company in order to do sub get subscriptions yes. for doing genealogy. No, but in actual fact, it's taken off so much that in fact they're probably getting more money from the DNA 
than they are from the subscriptions. If somebody say only something like 3 million of their 12 million people have paid subscriptions and the other 9 million have no access to their matches, trees or any of that stuff. Cecilia? So I, think they're, I think their advertising is hurting that completely because they so focus on the ethnicity through all of their advertising that people just go on, they do that, and they say, well, I just wanted to know where, I just wanted to know what nationality I was. I don't really care about the rest of it. And well, that hurts all the rest of what we're all trying to do. But why do you think there is this fascination in ethnicity or where you actually come from? Hmm. It's an American thing. Really. <laughs> 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 it is. You're right. It is. It is. It is. Because, because for those of us who come from lots of different places, I mean, those of you who are here and whose families have been here for hundreds and thousands of years, you already know that. But for those of us who haven't, we want to make sure that we're part of Irish. We want to make sure where, which part of Germany did you know my great great grandfather come from, and that's why they want to. But they, there are people who just want to know, well, am I German or am I Irish? Well, some of us want to get more specific than that. Well, my my three second cousins, they're brothers and sisters uh, over in Los Angeles. All three of them did the ancestry test, and I thought that's very very strange. Why why did all three of you? do the test, you're all brothers and sisters. She said, oh, we wanted to find out who was more Irish than the <laughs> other. <laughs> in, one, in one of the tests we did, I think my siblings, uh, I'm about a, a third, another sister is about uh, a quarter, uh, one brother is nearly 50%, and one brother is only 7% Irish. And I mean, I'm not sure how they work that one out. Mm. But why wouldn't, you, why wouldn't you want, if you are just siblings, why wouldn't you all want to do your DNA? Because since you only got 50% of your mother's DNA and 50% of your father's, you want to get the rest of it. So by doing siblings, you get more of it. That's true. Yeah. That's true. I don't think they're that involved in this particular family. They just wanted to get the number. Well, uh, it's funny you say that because I come from a family of, there were four children. Three of us were redheads and my sister <coughs> was not. So I had them all do the DNA test. I was a little bit worried about what her results might be, but she is a full sibling. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm being run out of the hall downstairs and locked out. Oh, really? The supplies that you need to get. Oh. Yes, we would be... Uh, it's almost five o'clock. Doesn't time fly when you're enjoying yourself? So unfortunately, we have to call it a, a day there, but please give a warm a round of applause to our expert panel. Thank you.